thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Youssef Bounair, and on behalf of the board directors of the Jerusalem Fund, I'm happy to welcome you back uh, to this Palestine Center event today, the Israeli elections and implications for U.S. policy uh, and Palestinians. Um, very happy to be joined today by uh, uh, Mr. Philip uh, P.J. Crowley, who is uh, uh, teaching now at George Washington University and is a former Just assistant. Up the street. Sorry? Just up the street. Just up the street, <laughs> right right next door. Uh, former Assistant Secretary of State for, uh, for Public Affairs. Uh, and we're happy to have his um, perspective here on our panel today. And uh, uh, Guy Ziv, who's an assistant professor in the School of International Service, uh, uh, the U.S. Foreign Policy Program at uh, American University. Uh, and he's written uh, a number of works on um, U.S.-Israel relations and also the intersection of um, Israeli uh, politics and peacemaking. So we're very happy to have uh, his perspective here uh, as well. Of course, um, a week ago today, um, Israel had uh, elections, parliamentary elections, uh, from which the next Israeli government uh, will be determined. Uh, it was one of the uh, two um, significant variables that were yet to be determined in recent months, uh, the Israeli election and, of course, the American election. Now we know uh, the outcome of both. Uh, we know we have President Barack Obama re-elected, and we know um, most likely we're going to have uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu being the Prime Minister of the next Israeli government um, and a, a coalition uh, forming around him as well. Uh, so uh, we've got a, a good amount to talk about in terms of the um, uh, reactions to the polling results themselves and what they mean for um, uh, policy. Uh, and I'm going to uh, start by uh, asking uh, Guy to give us his uh, reaction, uh, and, um, and we'll go from, from there. So, Guy? Well, good afternoon, and I uh, want to thank Yusuf for inviting me to participate in this uh, panel. I uh, want to keep my comments relatively brief because I'm sure there are going to be a lot of uh, questions here from the audience. I wanted to make three basic observations <coughs> about uh, this, uh, these elections that took place a week ago. First, uh, voters showed their dissatisfaction with the status quo. Second point I'm going to be making is that socioeconomic issues largely predominated. And third, I think we've seen uh, what I've called the Tea Partyization of the Israeli right. And I want to talk a little bit about that and its impact on last week's election. With respect to the status quo on the face of it, it seems that nothing much has changed because Prime Minister Netanyahu was easily reelected. There was not an analyst out there who uh, seriously predicted that anybody else would be reelected. Um, and so the uh, it was almost a foregone conclusion that uh, the next prime minister is going to be Netanyahu. Um, but if you look more closely at the results and the motivations behind the results, you'll see a slightly different story. And I think that that story is worth uh, telling. First of all, the voter turnout uh, in a typically status quo election tends to be pretty small. Yet uh, last week, it was higher than, much higher than expected. Uh, it was, in fact, the highest in the past 10 years, 68%. Um, there are many new faces this time around. Um, typically, the average turnover in an Israeli election is about 40 seats. In uh, last week's election, nearly half of uh, the Knesset is going to consist of uh, new uh, fresh faces. 47 members will be new. Five are going to be returning. So we're really seeing uh, uh, really a, a different kind of, um, many, many new faces, uh, diff very different kind of uh, Knesset slates uh, being elected. Also more religious, there are more religious MKs that were uh, elected this time around, and an unprecedented, an unprecedented number of women. 27 women will be entering the Knesset. Uh, this is an all-time high. It's uh, about 22%, a little slightly higher than the unprecedented number of women that were elected here uh, in this country uh, in uh, November elections, where we had it's about 19%. And uh, as you know, the party in power was uh, somewhat weakened, the Kud Beitenu, which was the joint uh, list that Netanyahu and Foreign Minister Lieberman cobbled together. Uh, they, they lost 11 seats. They went from 42 together to 31. 
and a brand new party that nobody really outside of Israel had ever even heard of, the Yesh Atid, headed by a man who very few people outside of Israel have ever heard about, Yair Lapid, uh, was the very big surprise second place finisher, uh, getting uh, 19 uh, seats. Um, I also want to mention in that regard that Netanyahu is a relatively unpopular prime minister. He's never been very popular. And even uh, there have been very few times, very few occasions, where he has surpassed the 50% mark in Israel. And I'm talking about Israel, uh, <coughs> Jewish Israelis in public opinion polls, and opinion polls that have been taking, you know, that have taken place over the past two decades. Um, only rarely has he surpassed the 50% threshold. Uh, for example, I think uh, a couple years ago, he addressed a uh, joint session of Congress was in May of 2011, so he came back, and because of national pride, uh, he got 53%, went up 38 to 51%, uh, to 51%, 38% to 51%. Approval rating, and now it's back down to 38 percent, or it's been 38 percent, or around 38 percent for the last few months. So this is not somebody who is a very popular prime minister. At the same time, when uh, the public is asked who can you see as the next prime minister, they put him up front because his opponents have uh, virtually no experience. Um, uh, Amir, I'm sorry, uh, Shelly Yakimovich is the head of the Labor Party. She's never been a minister. Uh, she's never you know, really served in any kind of government. Uh, same goes for Yair Lapid. Same goes for Tsipi. Uh, well, Tsipi Livni was experienced, so she is seen as somewhat ex experienced. <coughs> but uh, she was only foreign minister for a few years, and she was seen as a largely ineffective opposition leader who, um, who lost the chance to form her own government, despite the fact that in the previous election, 2009 election, Kadima, her, her formerly her Kadima party, got more seats, or at least one more seat, than the Likud party. Uh, with respect to my second point on the socioeconomic uh, issues, this is really the first time that I can recall, that many people can recall, where the peace and security issue was not front and center. Uh, this is very unusual, because traditionally every election is about the peace and security issue. This time it was really about bread and butter issues. Um, something as mundane as the price of cottage cheese, <laughs> uh, the cost of housing a little bit less mundane. There were major protests, major demonstrations in the summer of 2011 uh, that continued all uh, on in the fall and to some extent later. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets. These are middle class Israelis protesting what they felt was inequality, the unfair uh, costs uh, of living, uh, and the second uh, major complaint that they had was the unfair burden uh, with respect to serving in the army, because the ultra-Orthodox typically don't serve, and uh, more than 60% of ultra-Orthodox men do not work, um, as compared to 15% in the general population. More than 50% <coughs> of ultra-Orthodox women don't work, as compared to 21% of mainstream Jewish women. Uh, the majority of ultra-Orthodox, 56%, live under the poverty line and receive uh, government subsidies. And so this, this inequality and the unfair burden has been a major issue that's, that's simmered in past years, but has really, uh, really come up front and center uh, during this last election. Uh, the government's priority with respect to settlements, I'm sure that's going to come up uh, in this discussion, uh, is... An, uh, in the view, many Israelis misplaced. Uh, this is not to say that they are as outraged uh, about settlements as I imagine some of you are, uh, but they don't think that the priority is the right priority. They don't think that this is the right set of priorities, especially given uh, the other economic issues, the prospects for, uh, for you know, making some sort of progress in the peace process uh, that they haven't seen in recent years. They've seen really status quo. And uh, I think that that's kind of been um, really changing here uh, in terms of the, the priorities that the average Israeli is putting on, on these other issues. And finally, the, what I, as I said, the Tea Partyization, the radicalization of the Israeli right. Um, I should note that there is widespread skepticism among Israelis about the prospects for peace 
in general, and the idea that there is a Palestinian partner. Um, the majority of Israelis feel that there is not a uh, partner on the other side. They cite um, the uh, they, they cite President Abbas's weakness, uh, which pretty much everybody in the region agrees that he's relatively weak. Uh, we can debate the reasons for it, but uh, by most objective criteria, he's seen as weak. Uh, they cite his uh, 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 anti-Israel incitement, or what they view as anti-Israel incitement, coming from uh, the Palestinian territories, uh, where one would one sees in the media and in schools everything from the use of uh, of Hitler's ideas and analogies to the omission of the state of Israel in state maps, offensive cartoons, and so on and so forth. Uh, they see Hamas in control of Gaza, where ever since they've been in control of Gaza, there have been barrages of rocket attacks that have significantly affected residents who live in the southern part of Israel. They took a look around them, and they see a, uh, a very dangerous region. Uh, Syria is very unstable. They're worried about a spillover effect. Egypt, the one country that they have had in the past decent relationship with, is right now very unstable as well. Uh, even Jordan uh, seems to be a little bit unstable. And so they see themselves as weak, as vulnerable, and peace is simply not the foremost issue on their minds. At the same time, the majority of Israelis consistently, at every single poll that's been taken that I've seen, support a two-state solution to the conflict and want to see a two-state solution to the conflict, as skeptical as they are about the things I mentioned. And they are uncomfortable about the radicalization of the right. Even though it was not a major issue, uh, they have been watching from the sidelines, and they've been disturbed with what they've seen. The similarities between the Tea Party movement in this country and some of what we've seen in Israel are pretty striking. And I wrote a piece about that today in the Huffington Post. First. Uh, we've seen a rightward turn in party platforms. Uh, the Tea Party was very influential in getting the Republicans to move to the right in the last presidential election. Uh, same thing with the party platform in Israel, where many uh, members of Likud uh, rejected the very notion of a two-state solution and tried to remove that from the platform, even though the prime minister and the chairman of the Likud party had endorsed, it, uh, had endorsed the idea of a Palestinian state publicly at Bar Ilan in 2009. We, I can't tell you for sure what's in the platform because Likud Beitenu refused to release publicly <laughs> the platform. So we don't know what's in there. We know that it's had this rightward uh, influence. Uh, another similarity is the ousting of moderate members. We saw here Republican Party primaries, uh, the removal of longtime, well-respected, moderate Republicans, such as Senators Robert Bennett and uh, Richard Lugar and Lisa Murkowski. All of them were ousted and were replaced with Tea Party favorites. Same thing happened in the Likud Party primary that took place a few months ago. Uh, Longtime moderates or, or pragmatists, uh, people like Dan Meridor, mm -hmm. uh, Benny Begin, uh, uh, and uh, Michael Eitan were replaced with far rightists. Uh, offensive statements made by candidates. When we, everybody here has heard about the uh, legitimate rape comments made by some of the Tea Party favorites <laughs> in our elections here and in Israel. I mean, you, you know, some of the candidates really made some outlandish comments. Uh, one candidate from uh, Netanyahu's rival party, uh, Bennett's uh, party, talked about the, um, he was revealed to have told a, Christ a group of Christian Zionists last year that uh, that the, that the um, Dome of the Rock should be bombed so that a third temple could be rebuilt. Now, of course, he says that that was said in jest and that he didn't really mean it. He was actually critical of it. But, I mean, very outlandish comments that really raise eyebrows uh, in Israel. And racism. Uh, the Tea Party here was involved in uh, a number of different bills that sparked outrage uh, among African Americans. The NAACP protested some of these things. And in Israel, there have been a couple of bills, unfortunately, that passed uh, in the recent uh, Knesset, the last Knesset, that were seen as very harmful and, and borderline or even fully racist. And that includes the Nakba bill, 
uh, and uh, the establishment of an admissions committee to review who can enter certain communities in the Negev and the Galilee. Um, and the last point I want to make with respect to this radicalization of the right is this um, antagonism that's been displayed towards President Obama. Now, a lot of Israelis are indifferent or ambivalent, I would say, ambivalent towards uh, Obama. Uh, he's not disliked, but they're not really, they don't really have a, a strong sense of where he fits in the pro-Israel quote-unquote spectrum. But uh, they don't want to see any kind of deterioration in U.S.-Israel relations. That for them is a red line. And Netanyahu appears to have crossed that red line. And some of Netanyahu's staunch supporters and associates have gone further. I mean, there's one Likud Knesset member, Danny Danone, who wrote a book, anti-Obama book, and came to the States and promoted it. And he's very popular among certain Republican and Christian circles. But that doesn't, that doesn't sit very well with a lot of Israelis. So um, for these reasons, uh, they chose Netanyahu because they felt Netanyahu, that there was no other alternative to Netanyahu, but they really wanted to weaken Netanyahu. And they see, Israelis see Lapid as a possible check on Netanyahu. And I think they're comfortable with that idea. A more moderate version of the previous government, a more open version of the previous government, a government that's going to be a little bit more conciliatory and that's going to maybe reevaluate some of the national priorities. And I'll end my comments there. Thank you, uh, uh, Guy. I will just give my uh, thoughts on this, and then we'll, we'll turn to, to PJ after that. And then we'll go to uh, Q&A from the audience. And I should have mentioned uh, right at the top uh, that we're happy to take questions from those watching online, um, either through Twitter. You could send them in by um, sending them to uh, at Palestine Center. Um, and you can also send them in uh, through Facebook or on the chat roll on uh, the, uh, the website where you're watching the live stream. Uh, and then we can we can put them to uh, to our panel. Um, <clears throat> just a few um, um, general comments about um, some of the numbers coming out of the election that I feel were a little bit under discussed <coughs> that I want to talk about, um, and and then talk more about what what this what the the, the election result means um, in general. Um, first, just to go over some numbers, a, a number of people have. Um, asked about how Palestinian citizens of Israel voted um, and what the turnout was like. That has not been part of the discussion. Of course, Palestinian citizens of Israel make up 20% of the um, uh, Israeli um, uh, voting population. Um, Palestinian citizens of Israel largely voted for Arab parties, um, three parties for the most part. Um, and, and, and while they're Arab parties, they do have their, their differences. Um, in terms of their um, orientations. What was interesting, though, is that there was significant debate, um, <coughs> more so this time than at, at other points in the past, within the, the community of Palestinian citizens of Israel about whether or not to participate in these elections. There was um, a, a vocal movement to boycott the elections altogether, uh, and there was significant variation across different towns um, that are Palestinian towns uh, inside Israel in terms of the turnout. Some of them saw significant increases in turnout, whereas some of them saw significant decreases in turnout. On the whole, um, the participation of Palestinian citizens of Israel in the election was up, um, as was the trend throughout the entire election was up. Um, in 2009, about 52% of Palestinian citizens of Israel um, participated in the elections. Uh, this time around, it was about 55%. So you see a 3% increase. Uh, on the whole, with Israelis, you, you, Israeli voters in general, you saw a similar uh, increase, but it was uh, an increase from like 59% to about 62%. Uh, and so the, the middle of, of Israel is voting in larger turnout numbers than the Arab population. When you look at the settlements, though, and how they voted, what you find, really, I I that is very interesting is, is two things. First, turnout in the settlements also went up, but it was very high to begin with. It was about 74% in 2009, and it went up to about 78% in this election. So the, the settler community is far more mobilized and active uh, in their voting behavior 
than um, Jewish Israelis and uh, even more so than, than Palestinian citizens of Israel as well. That's number one. The other perhaps more uh, alarming number uh, is the um, increase in eligible voters in settlements this time around versus 2009. Uh, you saw a 45% increase in the number of eligible voters in settlements from 2009 to 2013. Um, whereas in the rest of the country, that increase was, in the, in the rest of the Jewish vote, that was 6%, and in the Arab um, uh, voting areas, that was 16%. So what you have here is these three different blocks, if you will, where you have a, a growing and steady Palestinian citizens of Israel vote. You have a growing and influential uh, uh, settler vote uh, as well. And then you have this group that is in the middle, the Jewish uh, Israeli Zionist vote in the middle. That vote is divided about 55% to the um, allies of Netanyahu and Netanyahu himself, and about 45% to uh, the opposition towards uh, Netanyahu. Um, so the middle is leaning to the right. Uh, the the problem presented by this is that, unlike American politics, um, Israeli politics is far more complicated than the left-right divide lens for analytical purposes. Uh, parties are divided along a variety of ethno-religious interests, and so you have some parties that are relying on ethno-religious communities for their consistent uh, votes whether this is the, the um, Eastern ultra-Orthodox or the Western ultra-Orthodox and what have you. Um, so those parties are going to remain fairly steady in their ability to draw votes. What is shrinking is the space uh, on the uh, side of the opponents to Netanyahu to reach 60 seats in the Knesset. Why? Because Arab parties have been traditionally excluded uh, and sometimes self-excluding from Zionist politics. And so the ability to reach 60 uh, votes, which is a majority in the Knesset, 61. 61, to reach a majority, is one that is dominated right now, has been and will continue to be, given demographic trends, by parties on the right and Netanyahu's natural allies. So I think there is a rightward shift in Israel, one that is structural in the long term because of demographics. and. Unless we see um, truly revolutionary change that shakes up this dynamic for the center of Israeli voters, those that are in the Jewish uh, Zionist center of Israeli voters, um, this is not going to change. Um, what we saw in this election is people coming out that were voting uh, for parties other than Netanyahu uh, and other than those in his coalition, particularly those that went to either Labor or Lapid's party, voting really on economic and socioeconomic issues. And the reason that this is um, disturbing is that you have a multi-decade long military occupation of millions of people who are denied self-determination. But the single largest mobilizing factor among the opposition to those policies in any way is around economic issues that aren't related to that. So you see Israelis going to the streets around issues like the cost of cottage cheese, but not around issues like the occupation. And so even the opposition to Netanyahu and his allies on the right has become far more timid in challenging the occupation policies of the right. So again, it's not just a rightward shift of demographics, but it's a rightward shift in terms of priorities. It wasn't a challenge to the priorities in that the opposition to Netanyahu was saying, we need to end settlements. It was, that shouldn't be the top priority. You're putting too much emphasis on this issue. We should focus on these issues as well. Uh, so um, I think there is, you know, a lot of the speculation in the lead up to this election was about um, the growth of Naftali Bennett's party and what that would mean. And I think one of the um, missing pieces in the analysis uh, was 
the failure to really understand where these other parties lie. Too much emphasis was placed on using the success of Naftali Bennett's party as a metric of, of right-wing movement in Israel. That's simply not the only metric. There are a lot of other things going on. Um, what this reveals, I think, more than anything else, and this is where it comes back to policy, uh, is the fact that uh, more than ever before, and, and as Guy rightly stated, you know, this is kind of remarkable that the peace question has, was not a major issue in this election. More than ever before, Israelis have become complacent to the military occupation of millions of people. It's become a thing that is acceptable. There's no movement to bring this to an end. There's no sense of urgency among Israeli voters to bring this to an end. And I think a lot of that is because the costs of the occupation have become very acceptable to Israelis. And uh, if we've seen anything over the past 20 years of the peace process, it's been the displacement of these costs from uh, Israel and onto Palestinians and international financers uh, of the Palestinian Authority as well. So there's no motivation to end the Israeli occupation if that occupation can be profitable and the costs continue to be low. So I think. What that means is we need to look for ways to change that equation. Because uh, the interests are structured in such a way right now that um, Israelis are not going to act unilaterally to end the occupation. They need to be incentivized to doing so. And while um, I agree with, 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 with Guy's interpretation of the Israeli perception of not having a peace partner, I think a lot of that is due to the conditioning of the Israeli electorate from the uh, statements <coughs> of their leaders more than the actual reality. You have, during this same period, probably the most cooperative and collaborative Palestinian authority that has ever been seen. Uh, and so it's, there's never going to be a lack of excuses to not make peace. The question that I think we need to be asking here in Washington is, how can we create incentives so that ending the occupation becomes a reality? And I think that um, if we're continuing to support uh, Israel in every possible opportunity through uh, economic, military, and diplomatic aid, uh, and not pushing them to end this occupation, we simply cannot expect that it's ever going to end. We are part and parcel of why this is happening uh, today. Uh, lastly, I would just make two points. Uh, one, on the Likud platform, you're absolutely right. They didn't, they, you know, they didn't put anything out. So we really don't know where the um, most recent um, iteration of Likud uh, Bekenu stands right now. But their most recent platform is something that we do have and is very clear. Um, they flatly reject the existence of a Palestinian state. Uh, on the uh, uh, western side, sorry, the uh, yes, the western side of the Jordan River, uh, they oppose the division of Jerusalem and will work to develop and strengthen the settlements in the West Bank that they refer to as Judea and Samaria. And aside from the lip service that we've seen from the you know Israeli Prime Minister in that that one speech, there's really no significant reason to believe that the party has wholeheartedly changed from these positions when, in fact, the policies that, that they've pursued um, suggest the exact opposite. Um, and, and, and the last point on the issue of support for the two-state solution um, within Israel, uh, when we look at that specific question, um, yes, when you ask Israelis, do you support a two-state solution to uh, this conflict, a slim majority have consistently said yes. The problem is when you ask them about the specific steps necessary to meet the minimal Palestinian requirements for a viable two-state solution, you don't have majorities that say yes on those key issues. Uh, when it comes to the division of Jerusalem, when it comes to the removal of the majority of settlements. Um, so um, what I think that polling ultimately tells us is that the Israeli polity supports separation from the Palestinians as a general policy. Um, what it doesn't show us is when we look at the more nuanced view is that they're ready to make the moves necessary to make that separation a peaceful one or a just one. 
Um, what is happening instead is separation is being achieved by perpetual occupation. And so long as the costs of that are inexpensive to Israelis, they don't seem motivated to challenge it uh, in any way. Um, with that being the case, I think really the onus then lands on outside parties to motivate um, the Israelis uh, to make changes uh, to their policies. And I think that the need for that has never been so clear uh, after these uh, elections. So uh, I will end there and, and, and pass it on to uh, PJ. And that, we pick up right from that point. And that's a, that's a dilemma. Um, in, in 2009, brand new uh, Obama administration uh, on its first full day in office, George Mitchell was appointed as a special envoy. Uh, and there was a fairly significant two-year investment uh, in, in the peace process that uh, um, failed. <laughs> had, had virtually, you know, no return on that political investment. And, and so, you know, and then over the next two years, the security landscape, not only for Israel, to some extent for the Palestinians, and particularly for the United States, has changed fundamentally. Uh, and I think we are still in that kind of you know, transition period where everyone is recalculating, you know, what is this new environment? Uh, and, then, and then, so there's a, there's a much different lens through which to evaluate, uh, you know, Israeli-Palestinian politics. Um, I should say I, I've, I've uh, got my first up-close exposure to uh, this uh, subject in 1998 at the White Talks and then at Camp David in 2000, so I recognize I'm only a relative novice, only 15 years <laughs> of, of, of looking at this. And, and I do think that um, the, the, the best thing that can be said right now is, is it could be worse. And, and I regard, could argue that, that that's not necessarily bad. Uh, and, and ultimately, the, the real dilemma for all of the players, both inside uh, Israeli-Palestinian you know, uh, politics in the region and here in the United States, is how do you calculate uh, time? You know, who, you know, who, who does time favor? And, and there are a myriad of, of, of views uh, uh, about that. Uh, but as, as you know, both Yusef and Guy have said, the, the, uh, what was fast, you know, I, I mean, and, and having watched in 1998, what, what happened in 1998 where the, the difficult dynamic between Bill Clinton and then Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu did become an uh, electoral issue that uh, brought Ehud Barak uh, to power. It, it is remarkable that what, what did not happen here, uh, that, that you know, yes, there was a subtext uh, Netanyahu uh, had his fingers in, in the American election. Obama had some comments that worked their way into the Israeli election, but it didn't necessarily change. It might have changed a couple of seats here and there, but didn't change, uh, you know, the fundamentals. Um, and that's because the U.S. overall U.S.-Israeli relationship has expanded beyond. It's it's not no longer driven just by the personalities, the two leaders. It's driven by a much broader uh, agenda. Uh, and of course, uh, you now has, have Congress as a very significant counterweight, uh, you know, where, where you know, a, a president in, in a first term in particular has got to look a little bit over his shoulder uh, at, uh, uh, at this. And, and so uh, you, the net effect was you, 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 you had a, an administration that came in in 2009 with an understanding that the Israeli-Palestinian dynamic was the number one security issue driving events uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and, and, and we believe that was true in 2009. It, it is not true in 2013. Um, the United States is looking at uh, this you know, within the subtext first and foremost uh, of uh, what is going to happen uh, with Iran. And, and of course that is a challenge that is very much shared uh, you know, in Israel. Again, and, and what we might not have envisioned even six months ago, that not only was the Israeli-Palestinian issue not really a significant electoral issue, nor necessarily was Iran a, a, a driving issue uh, in this upcoming election, or in the, in the election uh, just, uh, just completed. It was probably more of an election inside the United States than it was, or more of an issue here than it was uh, there. And I think the, the, the second aspect is obviously um, the dynamic among the various players has been transformed uh, over the past two years, not only by who's still in play, 
but by who's no longer in play. Uh, you, do not know, you do not have host Mubarak uh, in a position. You have uh, Mohamed Morsi. He was reasonably constructive in the context of helping to end the uh, uh, skirmish late last year between Israel and Hamas. Uh, but clearly, as we, as we know, he's got a much different perspective um, coming in uh, and, 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 and a much different political dynamic in terms of populism of, of policies and populism of foreign policies that uh, will, will you know, change uh, his perceptions and how far he's willing to go in the future. Uh, on the other side, you have a, uh, a King Abdullah of Jordan, uh, who has also been a constructive player in the past. And right now, he's got his hands full with uh, uh, his share of 700,000 Syrian refugees. Um, and, and, and obviously, other leaders are looking very closely at what's happening in Syria as well. So, so you, what, what it means is you have, in fact, for a variety of reasons, pushed the Israeli-Palestinian question. It's on the list. It's still important. It's not at the top. And, and that, so there's, there's just a different dynamic in 2013 than we saw uh, in, uh, in previous years. Um, and, and then you know, I mean, here in the United States, there's been a lot of discussion about the lack of rapport between uh, Barack Obama and Bibi Netanyahu. I would argue that's not necessarily been the, a, a significant limiting factor uh, in, in the last four years. The, the, real, the real difficult relationship is the relationship between Bibi Netanyahu and Abu Mazen. Uh, there, and there's no trust on, on each side. And I, I share the comments of my colleagues here that, uh, uh, that you know, Netanyahu has done very little uh, to, uh, you know, to help Abu Mazen, despite the fact that the security situation, the level of security cooperation between Israel and the Palestinian Authority has arguably never been better. Uh, and uh, over an extended period of time, you've had extensive calm uh, in the West Bank, e even with the tumult uh, in, in the rest of the region. And, and, and yet, uh, the, the present Israeli government and the emerging government will still have that same narrative that uh, they don't have uh, a, uh, a partner. Um, what the United States banked on in 2009 was uh, real sustained pressure from the region uh, to push uh, you know, uh, Abu Mazen forward uh, into uh, the, the peace process. A lot of reasons why that didn't happen. The Goldstone Report uh, you know, was, was, I think, a, a singular event from which the process has never uh, you know, really uh, recovered. Uh, and and uh, you also have the unresolved uh, you know, uh, political competition between Fatah uh, and Hamas. Uh, but we do know that uh, out of late last year and the, and the Gaza, latest Gaza crisis, uh, there are three people who perceive themselves as being winners. Um, Netanyahu believes he won something meaningful. Uh, Hamas believes it won something meaningful. Uh, uh, President Morsi believes he gained something. Now, he immediately gave it back you know, with the, uh, the decree, but he gained something meaningful. The one guy who was a spectator, and you can argue, debate how much he lost, but Abu Mazen was a spectator uh, in the Gaza crisis. And, and, and so he's having to recalculate again, uh, where, where, where do I fit into this, and where does the Palestinian uh, you know, pr uh, authority fit into this? And then finally, in the region, uh, you've got no one who's, uh, d despite you know, worsening economic situation for the Palestinian Authority, you've had lip service uh, by you know, key donors, but not necessarily any real money that uh, allows the Palestinian Authority to pay its bills uh, and, re and really redeems the efforts of uh, Prime Minister Fayed, who's trying to you know, prepare the Palestinian Authority for, uh, for a day where it becomes uh, a, a real state. So you, 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 there is an absence of a leader dynamic, uh, I think, that is very telling uh, in terms of, uh, of, of why the uh, process has been stuck for two years. And I, th I argue that I don't see anything coming out of the Israeli election, the U.S. election, or the dynamic in the region that is necessarily going to change that uh, in, the, in the short uh, to midterm. A and then finally, um, you know, it is this perception of time. Uh, and and I, I think I probably disagree modestly with Yusuf in terms of, of you know, if I'm, if I, I understand the, you know, where the various players are, I'm, I struggle 
to, you know, to offer advice to Abu Maz in terms of what should he do uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of you know, interim, interim period where, where realistically I don't think there are conditions uh, for any, any meaningful progress. Uh, I think there is a, there's a need for quiet uh, diplomacy, uh, see if, if what can be achieved uh, you know, on some, some secondary issues while you wait for more favorable conditions that may require at least one, two, or three leadership changes uh, before uh, you have a real prospect of, of, uh, uh, of progress. Uh, a couple of interesting decisions to, uh, a couple of things to watch. One will be you have a new Secretary of State starting on Monday. Uh, he'll go to the region uh, in February. Uh, what, you know, he'll want to, you know, get his assessment of the key players, but, but what he says, com John Kerry says coming back from the region middle of next month in terms of how he sees uh, the possibility for, for some activity will be very instructive. You know, likewise, uh, what decision does Netanyahu make not only in the fundamental composition of his government, but who will be his foreign minister? Uh, Lieberman has been the uh, de jure uh, foreign minister for the past four years. Barack, uh, Ehud Barak has been the de facto foreign minister for the last four years. Uh, Barack did not run for office. Is he invited back into the cabinet? where he will play a role in the future, that will be one uh, indicator. Uh, a second would be, um, if, if not Lieberman, who has some uh, financial issues or corruption issues to deal with, then who? Uh, uh, Lapid, uh, as, as uh, the, uh, the kingmaker, might want that job, but he's got no real international uh, experience. Uh, you could bring back uh, Zippy Libney, who has been there before, uh, as we were talking about before the uh, program started, uh, Netanyahu and Livni do not have a great you know, rapport. Uh, so do you see the emergence of a, of a new generation uh, of leaders and then how much, how much room does Netanyahu give that foreign minister to at least begin to carry out a public conversation and, and quiet diplomacy that might create some openings uh, you know, down the road. Uh, so, so we'll have some early indicators coming up, say, in the next four to six weeks that will really tell us how all of the key players are approaching this. Sure. Um, I'm Mitchell Plitnick um, with Interpress Service. <coughs> my <coughs> sorry. My, uh, my, ba my question is basically directed to PJ, but for everybody. Um, President Obama has already said that he intends to try and re-engage with uh, some sort of Middle East peace process, um, which strikes me as a, a, a vow to simply pick up something that hasn't been working all along. Um, is, are there any things that the United States can do um, that can lay, at, if, if you can't get to a solution now, as you're suggesting, that can at least lay some groundwork for a somewhat new approach um, to, to this issue over the course of the next few years if we're going to have to be waiting anyway? Um, I, I think maybe that, that's, the, that's the, an area where probably we have a little bit of a disagreement. Um, the, the question is, you know, can the United States impose a solution on two leaders that have to make very difficult decisions? Um, we, we've, over the years, we've, we've come up close to that edge, the Clinton parameters in 2000 were, are the closest thing to the school solution. They've been on the table for a long time, but you haven't had the political dynamic that gets any player, you know, close to accepting uh, those, uh, uh, those conditions. I, I was very intrigued last, late last year, where in a TV interview, Abba Mazen said, you know, uh, I grew up in what is now Israel. I live in Ramallah. And, and I, I, I plan to stay in Ramallah. I asked some of my uh, colleagues at the State Department, I said, I said, did he really mean that as kind of a, a, a real strategic message or did he, was it just a slip of the tongue? And, and there's, there's, there's different views as, you know, he, he got hammered, you know, by it. So if it was a strategic attempt, it cost him something. So I don't think he's going to necessarily say that. So, so there, there has not been a lot of ground prepared you know, for the difficult decisions that still have to be made. Um, I, I sat here last year, uh, or, or in 2011, uh, and John Mearsheimer was standing here and he said, the peace process is dead. And I said, I said, the peace process is moribund, but you can never, ever declare it dead because it is the only path 
you know, to a solution. The path is blocked right now. There, I, I don't, you know, so there's, there's low level stuff. Uh, my former colleague David Hale goes to the region on a regular basis. There are quiet conversations going on. Um, there, there are clarifications, you know, the, the ball is inching forward. Uh, these conversations are fruitful. Uh, there's probably more going on than you see on the surface, but ultimately, uh, you know, the, the, the major issues require leadership, uh, and that's where I think we, we may be in this transitory period where, where ultimately it might be the next Israeli government or the next generation of Israeli leader, the next generation of Palestinian leader, uh, and a future president that where the conditions are, are ripe for, uh, for uh, you know, a real, a real breakthrough. I, I just don't see it at least as far as I can see the next one to two years, uh, I think you're standing pat, you're doing some quiet things, but it's all preparatory work. And, and then as Yusuf said, uh, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the Abu Mazen's gambit at the UN has given a little bit of leverage. He's, he, you know, he's, he's had a weak hand, he's played that weak hand fairly well. He's gotta be careful about not overplaying it. Um, so I, I, just think, I just think we're doing quiet work over the next year or two and just seeing then if, if something opens up. Now, you're, you're, you're both out of the blue. What will fundamentally change the Middle East uh, is some sort of meaningful conversation between the United States and Iran. Uh, and if that meaningful conversation can get started, obviously uh, I Iran has some uh, some leverage with groups that, that uh, uh, will, ha will, will, will put their stamp on whatever happens in the future. So that's, you know, I think 2013 primarily is about solving Syria, or if it's possible. Uh, 2013 is about starting a conversation with Iran, hopefully. Uh, and then and it's doing some quiet work to see what might be possible uh, uh, down the road. Well, you know, I think PJ is absolutely right that this is where we disagree. Uh, and um, <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, there is, not a, there is not a perfect constellation right now of uh, within um, Israeli domestic politics and Palestinian domestic politics, but we can't wait for the planets to align to say now is the time for Palestinian self-determination. The time for Palestinian self-determination is long past due. And yeah, there are fundamental problems with American mediation of this process, largely due to the fact that this is a very pro-Israel country and a very pro-Israel town. We know that. We know that the United States has structural difficulties as well because of its electoral cycle and how difficult it is to negotiate peace as a first-term president uh, and, and then with turnover in various governments. But there is an alternative framework. While the constellations are not you know, where they need to be, while the planets don't line up, one thing is continuing to happen. And that is more and more Palestinian land is being taken and colonized and turned into Israeli settlements. So there's less and less of Palestine for the Palestinians. The alternative framework exists, and it's international law. I cannot understand why the enforcement of international law is mutually exclusive with the continuation of a peace process. Uh, it should not be. The, the United States should be able to take a position on international law and demand enforcement of it, even if there is not an ongoing diplomatic process at this point. There's no reason for the, for the peace process or the lack of it to act as a cover for continued Israeli settlement expansion. And you know, if that happens, then we're just creating incentives for uh, the peace process to go on in an unending way, without any, um, without any, without any real coming to uh, fruition. So, like I said, I that is where we disagree. Uh, let's go right here, the gentleman in the second row, and then we'll we'll come up here. Mansoor Ansari from Atlanta. I'm with Crescent International. Quick statement, then a question. Very briefly, please. The Palestine issue was as relevant in the Israeli elections as the so-called. Uh, Native American Indian uh, issue is in our U.S. elections. That's the statement. The question is, do you think the uh, Israel firsters in our Congress and Senate will block the uh, approval of Chuck Hagel? Or is our Congress and Senate simply a suburb of Tel Aviv? Any takers? He will be the Secretary of Defense. He will be? Nice. I, I, I have complete confidence. 
one thing I think that, that's important on this issue to, to note is that um, even even if there's th there's 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 a very strong pro-Israel contingency that does not want to see Chuck Hagel as Secretary of Defense, have made that very clear. Even if they don't succeed in that effort, what they've effectively done is police the discourse in such a way that for a Chuck Hagel to become Secretary of Defense, he's going to have to repent before a. Um, you know, a, a Senate uh, commission say, you know, these things that I've said in the past, they don't represent me, I don't stand by these statements, I don't, so on and so forth, and I pledge my, um, you know, continual undying support for the state of Israel, so on and so forth. Um, even if they're unable to block an appointee, they are successful in policing a discourse in such a way so that the only thing that is acceptable, that the political costs for nominating someone who is even moderately, I mean, you're talking about someone who voted for something like $40 billion worth of military aid for Israel year after year after year. You know, the question, and this is something I've written about, the question we should be asking is not, is Chuck Hagel pro-Israel, but so what if he's not pro-Israel, you know? But the, the, the interest groups are making us have a different discussion, I think, than we need to be having. And even if he gets appointed, uh, that, in a way, is, is a success that, that they have demonstrated that they're able to, uh, to gain. Yusuf, you, you said that the, from your s perspective, the principal problem at the moment was Israel's comfort with the, with the occupation, and therefore America's role would be to try to change that. Um, I've got to tell you that uh, from all my relatives and friends in Israel and from the Israeli press, I sense a tremendous discomfort almost across the political spectrum among Israeli Jews with the occupation. I don't sense any comfort. What I sense is a belief that the Palestinian Authority or any possible peace process that they can envision would not cause the West Bank to look to what happened to the West, what would not stop what would happen to the West Bank uh, if Israel withdrew uh, as what happened in Gaza when Israel withdrew, what happened in Lebanon when Israel withdrew. They think the same thing will happen and that's why they see no possibility of any kind of agreement at the moment and that's why they're looking at other issues but not because they're comfortable with the peace process. So I think if I'm right and you're wrong, I American policy has to be very careful uh, to look at both possibilities and see which one is really the situation on the ground before they pick a policy. I think um, on that point, one of, one of I think it's one of the big myths. Uh, and, it's, and it's something that, interestingly, President Obama said recently, or an iteration of it, uh, to um, uh, Jeffrey Goldberg, that um, you know Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't know what's in the interests of the state of Israel. There's this. Um, mantra that it is in the long-term interest of the state of Israel to end the occupation. I, agree. I, I, I think that there's a myth there. I think that it is in the interest of a uh, democratic Jewish state to end the occupation. But I think there's a difference between that and the state of Israel. I think the interests for the state of Israel are a complex mix of political and economic interests that benefit greatly from the occupation. And while the notion of a liberal democratic state may be something that would be benefited from ending the occupation, the dollars are invested in the occupation. There's a lot of political interest invested in the occupation. For that to change, fundamental calculations have to change. And right now, our policies are geared to ensuring that they do not. I thought we were talking about why the electorate didn't care about the issue. I thought that's, now you're switching it to why the certain leaders don't. I don't but the electorate doesn't care about it because they don't believe that it'll bring peace. That's one reason why they don't care about it. But, but there's a lot of reasons why. So listen, first, let's, let's be clear. Some of, some of the electorate, for the first time, voted for openly annexationist members of the Israeli Knesset. I mean, there, there is an annexationist caucus today that I agree with you. There are some, look, there, there, are, there are seven seats that went to merits. The six, six seats that merits. went to merits. You know, there, there's a contingency. Uh, there's, there's a constituency in Israel that wants to end the occupation. There's a constituency in Israel that there's an anti-Zionist constituency in Israel. Uh, but um, I think most Israeli voters don't see the occupation as a priority because it doesn't bother them that much. Maybe not because it doesn't bother them morally, but because it's not something that's really they have to deal with. You could drive through the West Bank today and not see a Palestinian if you're on these settler-only uh, roads. That and, was and also true when it was, when it was <coughs> issue number one in the election. That same thing was true. It, uh, it is more so today than it's ever been. 
and 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 as I said earlier, it, it it comes in a period where you've had the most cooperative Palestinian authority uh, ever. Um, anyway, let's uh, let's try to get uh, the lady in the back's been waiting patiently. Go ahead, ma'am. Hi. We're, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take one more after this one. So if you can make a brief, that would be great. I will. I was interested. It's mainly for uh, Guy and Yusuf. Um, what is your take on um, Yair Lapid's um, perspective on Israeli-Palestinian relations, especially in light of his uh, recent um, 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 mentioning of, of last week of him not entering uh, a block with what he referred to as the Zobis <coughs> um, nationalist. Um, Palestinian parties. You can go ahead. Yeah, uh, I. In order for me to answer that question, uh, I would be interested in, uh, in knowing Yair Lapid's position on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue. Yair Lapid uh, is has proven to be a pretty good politician. Um, he was able to somehow get away with uh, without ever mentioning explicitly what his red lines are what he would do, what he wouldn't do. He gave very vague statements throughout the election. Uh, what I do believe will happen is that he is going to be a check on Netanyahu, that he supports a two-state solution, that he supports a separation, uh, not out of um, any kind of uh, love for the Palestinians or any kind of support uh, for you know human rights, but because he believes that it's in Israel's best interest to do so. And so he is really a good barometer for uh, where the average Israeli is. Uh, I don't think that he has clear-cut uh, positions at this point. Uh, a couple of people who, are, uh, who he has selected to serve in his slate lead me to believe that it is going to be a moderate uh, party. That includes uh, a very moderate uh, Orthodox rabbi. It includes a former head of the Shin Bet who's on record as supporting a two-state solution and has been extraordinarily critical of Netanyahu for years now. So, I, I mean, it's, you know, he's not an ideologue, he's a pragmatist, but I think he's going to, uh, he's somebody who's also able to bring Israelis along. Last point I'll make, not about Lapid, but about Meretz, which Yusuf brought up. I actually think it is significant that while the uh, peace talks were not front and center in the elections, that the left was able to recover somewhat. Uh, uh, you know, the left was almost eliminated uh, after the Second Intifada. Mm -hmm. And for years, pe people talked about having no left at all left in Israel. And in these last elections, uh, a new merits chairperson, uh, Zahava Galon, was able to do a really brilliant job in galvanizing a lot of people who had previously voted for Kadima or other parties to go back to their uh, home on the left. And she doubled the number of Knesset seats. And again, that's not insignificant, uh, especially if you consider where the peace process was in the uh, priority list of the elections, and the fact that the far-right uh, party that ran, uh, which was a overtly you know, racist, uh, anti-Arab party, was not able to cross the threshold. But I, th I think it's, it's, it's just very sobering. I mean, what, what is remarkable is the disappearance I mean, you have a reemergence of labor, but a disappearance of Kadima, <laughs> you know. And and so a, a, a question going forward is is, is you know, whether Yeshatid is is a as somebody wrote the other day uh, a, a one hit wonder, you know, or or you know um, whether there there will be a a meaningful alternative to whether it's Netanyahu or someone out the right who wants to keep the status quo, someone who is willing to step forward politically and say I, I, I want to challenge the status quo. Uh, I, you know, I think that has to happen inside Israeli politics. I don't, I'm not sure it can be imposed from outside. I think the question um, that that uh, Guy gets to is, is is interesting, but I think it's really about staying power. At the end of the day, we don't really know how much of what we saw um, in terms of Labor's performance, in terms of Meretz's performance. By the way, Labor didn't exactly take a very uh, strong anti-occupation stance. They right. really campaigned around economic issues as well. But they paid uh, the price for that as well. And, and they paid a price for that, but largely because they also lost some of that vote to to Lapid. So they they split that across a, a number of different parties. The parties that did take the straw that made the the peace issue their priority in their uh, campaign, um, although it, 
with, 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 with different uh, frameworks uh, was Meretz and uh, uh, Hatnoah, right? And, and Tzipi Lipi. Uh, right. That is Hatnoah. Uh, yeah. So, and, and both of them, um, although relatively Meretz performed better than in the past, both of them were able to bring in six, seven seats tops, right? Um, so that's not, um, that's not exactly encouraging. Right, so what we saw is the disintegration of Kadima. The question is, where did it all go? go. And um, staying power is going to be very important. And these, n the, the parties that don't seem to be ideologically grounded, it seems don't have that much staying power. And one of the, 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 the single issue parties, for example, um, if you look in 2006, you had uh, a party that was fairly successful, came out of nowhere, uh, organized around one issue, was able to get six or seven seats, was the, the Gill party, a pensioner's party, right? Within one election, completely disappeared. So um, the question of staying power, I think, is one that is um, is one that is outstanding. I, I wouldn't be I, I wouldn't project too much um, in that regard um, just yet. When it comes to Lapid, though, we don't know too much, but we do know a few things. One, he decided to initiate um, um, his campaign, I believe, in in the settlement of Ariel, um, and stated there that he believed that that will forever be part of the land of Israel. Um, he's on record saying he opposes um, any division of uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Um, he's, you know, certainly within the Israeli mainstream on the right of return, which is completely opposed to it. Um, so this is what we do know. What we do know is not encouraging uh, in, in any way. But again, we don't know much. I think that Lapid's mandate is uh, one of socioeconomic issues and um, on the question of um, sharing the burden, as, as it's referred to, or the, you know, the, the, the role of conscription and who should serve and, and that sort of thing. In the coalition negotiations, that's where he has the most leverage. Uh, and I think Netanyahu knows that um, uh, well. And so if he gives to Lapid, it's not gonna be on the question of occupation policies, but it's gonna be more um, in these areas. At least that's, you know, that's how it seems to be. We'll see how it. Uh, plays out. We have time for one last question, then we absolutely have to, to wrap up. We'll go right here. Um, uh, then well, we'll first of all, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. My name is Durgham Abu Salim. I work here with the PLO delegation in DC. And I just had a question uh, quickly for Guy Zev. Uh, I read your piece uh, on the Huffington Post uh, about the shifts in Israel vis a vis the Tea Party orientation here in the US. And you did mention uh, that uh, part of the radicalization of the right is. Uh, attributed the, in part to uh, anti-Israeli incitement by the Palestinian Authority or the Palestinian side more broadly. Uh, however, I just found it a little odd that uh, the Tea Party orientation that seems to be going through Israel is just as insightful against Palestinians, yet you didn't seem to address that issue. I mean, how are the Palestinians to see a partner in peace while all these things you contend actually exist in the state of Israel? Thank you. Okay, well, I thought I... I thought I did mention it. Uh, in fact, I thought I discussed the legislation uh, that has been, uh, you know, the equivalent of the anti-Israel incitement, anti-Arab incitement. Uh, I discussed the statements, the outrageous and offensive statements made by a lot of the far-right candidates uh, this go-around. Um, so I thought I did that, uh, but if you didn't, but if I didn't do it, I'm doing it now. And, uh, and, I, and I agree with you that there is incitement on both sides, and that that, you know, that's unacceptable. And I think that the mainstream Israeli uh, does not go for that and does not accept it. Uh, and so uh, we need to clamp down incitement on both sides. I'm mm -hmm. sure you might have heard uh, Mr. Bennett Ross speaking about the issue of disbelief across both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering, as far as the issue of incitement on the Israeli side versus yeah. the Palestinian side, yeah. how does that play into the Israeli public opinion? I mean, why is it that, I mean, mm -hmm. they claim that they find it difficult to find a partner in peace with the Palestinian right. side, whereas Mr. Yusuf and I are here emphasize that right now you do have a cooperative Palestinian Authority that in fact invited newly elected members into the Knesset to see where things are going. Yeah. Whereas Palestinians are consistently like blamed for not being part of this Lapid. But meanwhile, the, the same issue which you contend exists in Israel continues to be almost dismissed. There is no talk about that. I How think we- Does any citizen in public actually look into himself and examine what's going on there on their side, internally speaking? Well, I, I can't speak for every Israeli citizen, right? Uh, I can only uh, tell you what the polls show and what the public sentiment <coughs> seems to be over there. Uh, and there is a perception, uh, just as there is a perception among Palestinians that uh, they have no Israeli partner, there is that perception in Israel that there is no 
that there's no Palestinian partner. I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. I'm, I'm somebody who believe I'm part of the peace camp. I believe that uh, Israel has not just uh, Israel has a duty, you know, uh, to to do everything humanly possible to achieve a two-state solution before uh, before it's too late for Israel. And I'm saying that from the perspective of somebody who does consider himself to be pro-Israel. Uh, so I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you uh, on this, uh, but there is a perception, even among people in the peace camp, even among leftists, even among you know people who are very left in Israel, and they exist, and there are many of them in Tel Aviv, uh, that there is no real partner with whom to negotiate, which is why it was for them not a number one issue, not a top issue in this election. Now uh, I agree with Yusuf that the leadership in Israel, specifically Netanyahu and, and his colleagues, uh, have played a role in manipulating this message. Okay. On the other hand, you have President Shimon Peres, who has a ceremonial position, who's in a ceremonial position, but has recently lashed out at Netanyahu and lashed out at this narrative, has challenged this narrative. He's saying what you're saying, that there is a moderate leadership Great in the West Bank with whom Israel should negotiate. So you, we are hearing some voices there. Uh, you know. Thank you all uh, very much for coming today, and thank you to all of you.